Anil, it is amazing to be with you. Uh, hello, everybody from Transec. It is great to be with you. Um, this is going to be a super fun conversation. Nicole called me and said, who in the world would you want to talk to most? And I said, oh, give me a Neil Seth. Let's talk consciousness. So uh, I got exactly what I wanted, and I'm really excited. And I want to sort of ease into this topic because I don't think people have a really good history of science view on how really radical it is. I always tell people, you like forget about consciousness until Jacques Pansep published Affective Neuroscience in the 1990s. You couldn't even talk about human emotions. That was not a serious topic for neuroscience and science and let alone consciousness. And yet here we are 20 years later, your work on the subject, a lot of other people's work is massively respected. Walk us through what happened. How did it change? Oh, thanks. Um before I do that, I just want to say I hope, given that we've got some time, I'm really hoping we do get to talk properly about flow as well, because this for me is one of the more exciting frontiers of research into consciousness as sort of a, a conscious state that, that has been, I think, neglected in the laboratory up until now. So I'm, I'm really excited for the chance to talk to you as well about this you stuff. Know, you know I don't disagree. Um, I, <laughs> I was guessing. But you're absolutely right about the, the sort of historical trajectory that, that consciousness research has followed over the last 20 or 30 years. And I have to be honest, I feel very lucky to have begun my and started my career at a time when a, a scientific interest in consciousness was not automatically a sort of suicide note for, for an academic <laughs> career. I was an undergrad in the, in the, uh, in the um, when was I undergrad? In the early 1990s, quite a long time ago now. And I still remember, I was studying psychology at, at the time, because I think everybody at some stage is interested in consciousness. I mean, we're all interested when we're kids about these big questions. Who am I? What happens when I die? How can this stuff, this kind of electrical pate stuff inside our skulls give rise to a conscious experience? I mean, these are just intrinsically interesting mysteries that most of us grow out of. But, you know, I was still always curious and studying psychology in the 90s, I remember the International Dictionary of Psychology. Uh, it was an entry on consciousness by Stuart Sutherland. And he said that consciousness is a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. Nobody knows what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. Nothing worth reading has been written on it. And that's kind of quite a, it's quite a severe dismissal of the whole field. And of course it was, it's not, was never that extreme. They've always been interesting uh, research avenues about conscious experience, people studying what happens when you fall asleep, people beginning to interpret things like EEG data as signatures of consciousness. Uh, but it was still largely absent from mainstream uh, research in neuroscience and psychology. And that did all start to change in the in the 90s. And I think for two main reasons. The first main reason was uh, technological. So we had brain scanners suddenly, well, not suddenly, but but rather quickly, fMRI machines in particular became quite widespread. So we could actually look inside the living human brain while people were having different experiences. So this gave, gave people a methodology. We could start looking for what became known as the neural correlates of consciousness. What happens in the brain when someone consciously sees something compared to when they, you know, they still see it but are not consciously aware of it? Uh, and with that methodology, we can start looking for, if you like, the footprints of consciousness in the human brain. And the other, I think, big development was, was more political in a way. So people like Francis Crick, of course, the co-discovered the structure of DNA, and Gerald Edelman, who was my old uh, mentor when I was a postdoc, they both won their Nobel Prizes doing proper science. You know, DNA and, and Edelman discovered the uh, structure of a, the an immune system uh, in some way, in some very clever way. So they kind of cashed in their capital from that to reinvigorate the study of consciousness. And, and I think a lot of people then followed uh, and it, within the next 10 years, it became reasonable to publish about consciousness, but more importantly, it became possible to even get funding. And of course, unless you get funding, uh, science is dead. Do you think it's been difficult? I know you've written about this a little bit lately in relationship uh, to the rubber hand illusion. 
is it difficult to preserve scientific integrity while studying <laughs> consciousness? Or what, what, what are you suggesting? How difficult <laughs> is it for you? And how much of a razor's edge do you feel like you're walking? Sorry, I'm well, to throw you under the bus here, my friend. <laughs> I'll just sort of ignore the insinuation about my absence of integrity there. Um, no, I, didn't no I, I think that's it. No, of course, I knew you, I knew. other people had that. I don't. I don't think it was you. I like. I was talking about your rebuttal. I'm siding with you, man. Yeah, but well, I, I think it, it's a, there's a serious point there, and it's still. I think it's still the case that uh, people getting into neuroscience now, the grad student level, post, you know, are are sometimes legitimately worried about. Um, whether it's still like, whether it's 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 a reasonable thing to do you know if it is it gonna be rewarding or feasible as a career and and well i think it is um but it is still a, a topic that is laden with some controversy um on the one hand it's massively important you know, in a sense there is nothing that's more important than understanding the nature of our conscious experiences. Without consciousness, nothing else really matters, whether it's an experience of flow or whether it's an experience of pain or suffering or joy. Um, unless a state of the world or the body impacts on our conscious experience, it, it, it doesn't matter to us as people. Um, it's just massively important. But it's still, in many respects, it is still a mystery. And I want to be kind of upfront about this and not not make a claim that we we now have the royal road to just unpacking the solution uh, that it's easy in fact i think there's still a deep mystery about how consciousness fits into our picture of how the universe works there's a difference between admitting that there's still a mystery there and saying we can't do anything about it because i, I do i think as we'll talk about I, th I think we really can but where the question of integrity comes up i think is in not over promising so I think there is a worry about coming up with with really grand uh, solution or, or proposed solutions that when you look at them more closely, don't really do the job they're supposed to. I mean, I, I almost got put off consciousness right at the beginning when I was reading a raft of theories that purported to explain consciousness in terms of quantum physics of one sort or another. And I was sort of put off because these theories, while compelling at one level, didn't really explain very much. And they seemed in, in another way just to replace one big mystery, which is consciousness, with another big mystery, which is quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, without really saying how they specifically related. So there is a question about promising too much. But on the other hand, if we just get on with the job of trying to figure out what in the brain explain specific aspects of consciousness, then I think uh, we're on the right track. And then I think one can one can retain yeah, one's like, scientific dignity. I'm reminded of a, a, a biologist, Andrew Hessel, who runs the Human Genome Right Project with George Church. He says 98% of the time when somebody uses the phrase quantum physics in a sentence you can just replace with magic fairy dust, and you've got roughly the same thing. Um, though there are people who actually, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and in a sense, I mean, it, it's still true that quantum physics is uh, currently the best picture we have of how things work in the physical universe. But that doesn't mean that it's specifically relevant to understanding the phenomenon of consciousness. In this context, I do think it well, is. You set, you set me up for where I want to go next, which is you have been arguing for a while, and, and, I, and I really love your language around it. To me, it's I feel like you're, you're the first really sane man in the field talking about the real problem of consciousness as a problem that can be solved through biology. So um, let's talk a little about about that and let's talk um, and let's use that as a springboard into some of your core ideas about consciousness as a, as a controlled hallucination and sort of as a way of getting there. Why don't, if, if you can, if we can't, don't have to do it super slowly. If you could just walk people through the voyage of discovery that sort of got you to these ideas. Okay, that, <laughs> I shall try my best. Um, uh, somebody start a clock. If he's still talking at two in the afternoon, <laughs> we'll go to another question. I can, I can do it pretty quick. So that the um, when people think about what an explanation of conscious experience might look like, uh, 
One of the common reference points is the philosopher David Chalmers, who distinguished between what he calls the hard problem of consciousness and the easy problems. And the hard problem of consciousness is the problem of how and why any physical stuff should be identical with or give rise to any kind of conscious experience whatsoever. It's, it's how you cross that explanatory gap between the physical world and the world of subjective experience. Because the, the intuition that drives the hard problem is that no explanation uh, in terms of mechanisms could ever be sufficient to explain why consciousness is part of our universe. Why, why aren't we all just robots, biological robots going about our business with no inner universe, no lights on inside? That's the hard problem. And it really is difficult. It's unclear what it would take to cross that explanatory gap. And the easy problem, by contrast, is the problem of figuring out how the brain works as a physical system, how sensory information is processed, how decisions are made, how we pay attention, how we come to say things, like even say things about consciousness. But we can address easy problems without having to worry about the hard problem at all. And so the, the concern for all this is that even if we answer all the easy problems, if we understand everything about the brain as a physical system, then we might have absolutely no idea about how and why consciousness is part of the picture. The hard problem in this view remains pristine. Now this might be right, but my, and others too, I mean, certainly not the only one, concern is that there's really a failure of imagination going on here. We don't know what it would be like to understand the brain in massively more detail than we do now. And also, we can ask and answer questions about consciousness without having to address head on this question of why and how consciousness is part of the universe. And there's a historical analogy for this, which I always find useful, even though it's not perfect, and, and we can talk about why it's not perfect, which is how we've come to understand life. 150 years ago or so, people thought life was as mysterious as people think consciousness is today, more or less. People did not think, serious scientists of the day did not think that any kind of mechanism inside a body could explain the property of being alive. There was a, this idea that we needed a special source, an elan vital, a spark of life. Uh, and that was the philosophy of vitalism. And of course, now there's no need to appeal to any of this kind of magic life stuff, this special source. We don't understand everything about life, but we know enough that it's no longer a conceptual mystery that mechanisms of a particular kind can be alive. And of course, there are lots of gray areas like viruses and whatnot. Um, and so that's demystified life in some way. Now, I think the same approach is what we should take and what many people are taking to consciousness. So I've just given this a label, which is sort of the real problem of consciousness. And the idea here is that we try to explain the properties of consciousness in terms of mechanisms in the brain and the body. In just the same way that biologists 100 years ago tried to explain the properties of life. And so we divide them up. Life is many things. There's metabolism, homeostasis, reproduction, and so on. And in consciousness, it's not just one big scary mystery in search of one kind of eureka moment of a solution. There are many, many, many related mysteries. Why, what is the difference between wake, sleep, drowsiness, coma? Uh, why do I perceive, why is a visual experience different from an emotional experience? You know, what is a volitional experience and what is the role of an experience of volition in, in generating action? There's lots of, um, you know, what, why is the self different from the world? There are lots of sub problems and, and, and I think we can make most progress by picking these problems off one by one, trying to explain how different kinds of experiences come about. And if we do that, my hope is, and I think there's already some evidence for this, that this big scary mystery of the nature of consciousness in the universe starts to, to fade away. So rather than solving the hard problem, what I want to do with this sort of real problem approach is dissolve it. I want to, I want to 
talk shortly to uh, your idea of consciousness of control hallucination, but you set me up so nicely for this question. I just got to ask, what do you think is the low hanging fruit in terms of the little biological problems around consciousness? Like, what do you think are some of the puzzles next three to five years? It is reasonable to assume we might get some clarity on. That's a really good question. It's uh, these low hanging fruit just always seem to be a little bit out of reach. Um, but I think two things that that, that are coming that, that I can see on the horizon, we already understand a lot, a lot more than we used to. Questions like why does consciousness fade in sleep and anesthesia? Um, that's something for which there's now an awful lot of empirical data. Um, and it's more than just data that arbitrarily goes along with falling asleep or, or, or losing consciousness and anesthesia. It's data that sort of explains why consciousness is lost there. Um, because we can see how communication between different brain regions falls apart in very specific ways when you fall asleep or lose consciousness and anesthesia. Uh, and that, yeah, that I, I can see as, as being solved to the point at which it becomes pretty easy to predict from data about somebody's global state of consciousness, their level of anesthesia, their level of wakefulness. This is, of course, practically useful as well for people um, who are in these kind of gray zones where it's unclear from the outside whether they're aware or not, maybe after severe brain injury. Um, so that's one area I think we can, we can do well at. Another area I think we can do very well at is trying to understand the difference between different kinds of perceptual experience. So why is a visual experience different from an emotional experience or an olfactory experience or, or something like that? What, what is it that's going on in the brain that really determines the character of a perceptual experience? And of course, how much does a human soul weigh? We'll have that. <laughs> Right, six months from now. 42 now. grams, right? That's 42 40, grams. Right. Well, you know, this, this is brilliant because I, I looked into this recently that it was, um, it was, you know, people tried to replicate it. It was debunked. It was it was really nicely debunked yeah, because good. to start with, so it came from a few, so that, uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a story in I think the late 19th century, and I forget the doc, it's Dr. McDonald, I think, from somewhere, who was weighing people at the moment they died and therefore trying to measure by, by noticing whether the scales change at the moment of death, you can weigh the soul because the soul, of course, leaves the body precisely at the moment that you die. Um, and so he noticed this and, and said, OK, it's 42 grams. That's the weight of the soul. Uh, but when he tried to do this on dogs, uh, it didn't work. He couldn't observe any change in the weight of dogs when they die. But of course, some people said, well, that's, that makes perfect sense because dogs don't have souls. Only people have souls. Uh, but then much then they was trying to replicate with more humans and uh, couldn't do it. But of course, that's back to the integrity thing. A good story oh, yeah. lasts, I, I, I just lasts love any decent refutation. The, I just love that there's a reputation crisis in the weight of the soul. Right. <laughs> um, and, and and by the way, they're panicking backstage right now because there there's a whole bunch of people going, oh, my God, don't tell Stephen dogs have no souls. Bad things. <laughs> are happening. Um, we're going to well, skip. Tell you, yeah, we don't have souls either, of course. Yeah. Minute, but you know, okay, not to enough. worry about them at this point. <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, sort of one of your core ideas. It was it was, it was uh, at the center of your TED talk, which uh, I think has been uh, viewed nine million more times than mine. Um, but I'm not jealous. Um, and uh, uh, so talk to me a little bit about, um, first of all, it's a great idea, but talk to me about where, where, it, come from, where it comes from and what you exactly mean by that. So it's, it, this, this is the idea of perception as, as what I called and what other people have called a controlled hallucination. Now, it's a very old idea. Again, like all, I think all good probably even all bad ideas. They, they have plenty of historical precedent. This goes right back to Plato. But um, I think the best point of origin, so we don't take six hours to tell the story, is uh, with Hermann von Helmholtz, who was a, a German polymath. And he came up with this idea of perception as a process of inference. And the best way to 
I think to understand that is just for a second to imagine that you are your own brain. So if you just really think what it's like to be a brain and a brain, there you are, you're your brain, you're trapped inside this bony vault of a skull and you have no direct access to what's out there in the world. All you're getting as a brain is streams of electrical signals, which only indirectly reflect what's out there in the world. They don't come with labels attached, these signals. They don't come with a label like I'm from a coffee cup or I'm from a beer or I'm from, you know, I'm from the heart. They're just electrical signals. And the brain has to make sense of these electrical signals and conjure a world. And when we open our eyes and we just sort of experience this world out there, you know, I open my eyes, I see my computer in front of me, I see Stephen, I see it lights. Um, there's this sort of naive realism to our experience that it seems as though our eyes, our senses, our transparent windows onto a objective physical uh, reality. But that is just how evolution has designed perception to work. Uh, everything that we experience out there in the world, and as we'll get onto in here in the body and, and the self as well, is a kind of perception. It's an inference, a best guess that the brain is making about the causes of sensory signals. And so the brain has to, <clears throat> has to, in some way, interpret, make sense of sensory signals. And in order to do that, it, it, the idea is that it's doing this process that in, in statistics we call Bayesian inference. So there's some data and we're trying to, the brain is trying to figure out what was the most likely cause uh, of that data. Just as in, you know, in medicine, if you take a test, and you're trying to figure out what the most likely cause of, of that test is, of, of the symptoms that you have. Um, and what we experience is the contents of the brain's best guess about the causes of its sensory signals. What this means is perception is not this passive readout where sensory signals come from the outside world and are sort of gradually percolate into the brain and are, are read out in more and more complex ways. It's a projection from, from the inside out or from the top down. So the brain is constantly sending back to the sensory organs, whether they're the eyes or the ears or the nose, predictions about incoming sensory signals. And the sensory signals themselves are just treated as error signals. They're there to keep these predictions tied to their causes in the world. They're prediction errors. Uh, so, and I think this is a real sort of inversion of the way intuitively we think about perception. Intuitively, it seems as though we read out sensory signals from this outside in direction. But in fact, it's all, it's the other way around. The content of our perception is coming from the top down or the inside out. And so this is why I call it a, a controlled hallucination. By the way, this is a phrase I first heard from a, uh, another mentor of mine called Chris Frith, who heard it from somewhere else and, and so on and so on. But it's this idea that there's a continuity between what we typically think of hallucination and what we call perception. A hallucination we typically think of as perception of something that's not there, kind of false perception. But really, hallucinations, dreams, perception, they all come from the inside out. It's just that in normal perception, our, our hallucinations are controlled, are reined in by sensory signals from the world. So perception is a controlled hallucination. And, and of course, by the same argument, hallucination is just a kind of uncontrolled perception one of the uh one of the experiments you sort of ran around this i'm sort of fascinated by was your google dream keep do google <laughs> deep dream experience and then stephen suffered aphasia mid-talk <laughs> um where you simulated the effects of overly strong predictions right people predicting reality and you, and you tilted things into hallucinations in the, in the version i saw of it where you're messing around with it uh, you cued people to see dogs all over the place. Um, my question was, how many, how many of the incoming cues that we're taking in, how much did you have to mess with to get people to see dogs where they we would normally see normal reality? Uh, that's yeah, that's a, a good question. So what, yeah, what we did in, in this, uh, we should have queued up a video of this. Actually, we don't have one, but um, it's this was. This was just the idea to, to test out 
a theory about hallucination from this perspective, because I think as we were just saying, if perceptions are controlled hallucination, then when people are actually hallucinating, what's probably happening is their perceptual predictions are overwhelming the sensory data so that they see things that other people don't. And in a sense, we are all familiar with this a little bit, because if you look at, you know, you, we can all see faces in clouds or in teapots or in, in clever arrangement of windows. We see faces in things because the brain... Yeah, is, I, mean, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Some people don't. I mean, there are some people with, with what's called prosopagnosia who, who just don't right. see faces through it. Uh, but, but most of us tend to see faces and things, and the brain is projecting as preloaded prior expectations that fa of faces into the world in general. So we, we tend to see faces when faces aren't there. And so you can just think of this, this dial uh, being always tilted to the, a balance between predictions that the brain is expecting or is thinking is important because faces are very important for us and what the sensory data shows. So what we did with this Google Deep Dream was, was just play around with it a bit because this is one of the nice things about consciousness research. A lot of it is kind of, you know, all science starts with playing around and just, figure, just figuring out what you can do. Um, I think that's, that's one reason it's a, it's a beautifully creative process. But we wanted just to simulate that, that idea. And so this algorithm developed by Google called Deep Dream is perfect for this because there are now all these machine learning algorithms that are very good at telling you what's in an image. You give it an image, it will classify it and say there are dogs in it, there are people in it, there's a car in it, you know, many, there's this breed of dog, that breed of dog. Very good at processing from the bottom up and telling you what's in an image. But what you can do with Deep Dream is do it the other way around. Basically, you fix the output and you say dog. And then you update the image until that prediction is satisfied. So this is like simulating faces in clouds on steroids, right? You're, you're updating the sensory data until it matches you, a prediction that you've already fixed about what's there. And when you do this through Deep Dream, it's not that you sort of see a movie with dog faces photoshopped onto it. Dogs seem to organically emerge out of the image all the time. And what we did was we took a panoramic video uh, of Sussex campus and processed it in this way and so that people could put a VR headset on and look around and see their whole world suffused by dogs. And anyone who's done this um, will tell you that it's kind of redolent of, of a psychedelic hallucination where complex objects organically appear out of the scene in front of you. So it's, it's fun to do this, but it's also an important clue that we're on the right track in some important way about how perception works in general, because we can start to simulate unusual forms of perception in just the way you would expect if perception is this kind of top-down uh, controlled hallucination. And um, just to directly answer your question, though, because we were sort of so upfront about this and we basically create this movie, it, it works more or less the same way for everyone. But one important individual difference that we are looking in much more detail now is another subject that, that was very had a very scandalous reputation in psychology, which is hypnosis. Um, and it turns out that people are reliably different in how hypnotically suggestible they are. And by, by hypnosis, I'm not talking about just waving a watch in front of your face and you go off and do uh, you know, bidding or, or big stage show magic or anything like that. But simply how a, a suggestion to experience something can lead to that person experiencing that, that thing. And for me, this is a really interesting window into individual differences in conscious experience. Um, but it also, just to echo a very, an earlier point, it's also a problem for a lot of psychological experiments because if we're studying what people say about their experience and they differ in how suggestible they are, then this, is, this can be a massive confound. People might respond differently because they are differently hypnotizable, not because of the thing you're doing in the experiment. Um, but this is something that, that is a line of research that we're going into that, that I think is, is super interesting in its own right, but yeah, indeed also relevant for lots of experiments. A lot more experiments are going to have to control for suggestibility that they, when they previously weren't doing that. 
One question I'm just wondering as, as I'm listening to you talk, um, where do you think the line is between hypnosis, as you're describing it now, and what psychologists talk about is reframing, right? At the heart of cognitive behavioral therapy is our whole bunch of reframing techniques. So how do they differ in terms of, you know, I mean, you can use reframing to prime all kinds of stuff and, you know, get really good impact in psychological data on that. So how do, where do you draw that line? And is there any neural data or that to put that line? Um, I'm not entirely sure where you, where you draw that line. I think there are a lot of concepts that, that, that touch on an as yet unrevealed underlying cause. So whether we talk about suggestion and hypnosis, whether we talk about reframing and in, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, whether we talk about demand characteristics and psychological experiments, these are, these, you know, it's a very old concept that subjects might just do what they're expected to do. They might in fact just experience what they implicitly expect to experience. These all, I think, pick out very related phenomena. Quite how they differ is, is a very interesting um, question that, that I think indeed we need to get more specific about, about the mechanisms. So this again is something that I, I, I want to look much more into in the next few years about how things like suggestions have their effect at the neural level, uh, or certainly at the cognitive level. Similar but related, um, you, you, you've said that um, since reality is a sort of controlled hallucination that when all of us agree on our hallucinations, we call that reality. And so what I was wondering, not that I necessarily know if this question is answerable, but how little or how much information is actually required to get us to agree on a shared reality? Yeah, that's a, huh. By the way, while I think about that, I want to so say that um, line about when we uh, agree on our hallucinations, that's what we call reality. I just have to give proper credit to, uh, to a guy called Baba Brinkman, who came up with that line, gifted it to me. He's a, he's, um, I don't know if anybody in the audience has, has come across him. He's a, a peer reviewed rap artist. So he does rap guides to evolution, to climate change. And, and I worked with him on a, on the rap guide to consciousness. So there is in fact an hour long rap show about the neuroscience of consciousness that, uh, that I think is a kind of a unique thing. <laughs> this is my new And that will involve flow. You know, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything more kind of exemplifying flow than, than uh, freestyle rap, um, as far as I know. I'm certainly not exemplifying no, I, I myself. agree, and as you know, some of the good imaging work on flow has been done on rappers. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But but to your, to your question about what are the sort of minimal conditions for us to agree I think there's short answers. I, I don't know, um, but it strikes me that it's probably more interesting, or it, it might be more productive to us. How how much evidence do we need before we start disagreeing? You know, mm -hmm. there, there could be just a a tendency to. I mean, I think we we often have this tendency to assume that people experience the same world that we experience. Uh, if I say I see, if you know, if, if I see what a car on the corner of the street, then you know, I assume that you see the same thing too. If I see, uh, the, if I if I look at a coffee cup and I see that it's red, I'm assuming that somebody else sees it as red. And we know that's not true. We know that people see colors differently and sometimes dramatically differently. So I think many people will remember the the dress, this iconic image from a few years ago now, which to half the world looked blue and black and to the other half the world looked white and gold. And this was a beautiful example of found psychology. You know, it wasn't designed in a lab, this, this experiment. It just so happened this particular image hit a sweet spot in how the brain processes ambient light to decide color in a way that, that made clear a very subtle individual difference in, in, in this process of taking ambient illumination into account. But what was fascinating was how entrenched people were in their particular belief that the dress was blue and black or white and gold. It was very difficult to convince somebody who saw it one way that other people could see it the other way or that, it, or that in fact 
the real dress was not how they how they saw it. And so I think we have this kind of preloaded conviction that what we experience is real. And that makes it very difficult for us to appreciate that other people might see things differently. And so in fact, this is this is maybe one of the sort of social implications of this this view of perception that to the extent that we can understand our own perceptions as constructions, if we can get under the hood of our own naive realism, it might make it easier for us to, to have a kind of perceptual empathy, to appreciate that other people might perceive things differently. And you know, just to be very, very outlandish about this, if we can do that, you know, maybe that's, that's one way to understand, well, if you can see things differently, maybe that's why we can believe different things to be the case. And of course, then oh, at the end of the day, we can all get on and agree. And of course, that's not going to happen. But understanding our, our sort of our own perceptual frailty, I think, is important step on that process. Similar related, um, do you think, what do you think is the minimum biological requirement for consciousness? Is the brain, brain neural network, neuroplasticity, right? There's a, there's a bunch of cases, whether it's split brain patients or the missing cerebellum, some of those things that start to challenge some of our, our, our better theories about consciousness. So I was wondering, what do you think is the minimal biological requirements? Yeah, this is, this is, I think, again, a, a reasonably addressable question, at least in humans. Of course, there, there are actually many different ways to think about that question. You could think about what are the minimal uh, conditions for consciousness in any creature you know, versus what are the minimal parts of the brain in a human versus what are the minimal parts of the brain right now compared to over time. You know, maybe it's necessary to have uh, you know, a cerebellum over time, but not right now. But I think we can so if I take the simplest first. What is necessary for you and me right now to be conscious? One of the surprising things here is that uh, three quarters of our brain in terms of neurons is not needed at all. You already mentioned it, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is, is the little brain that hangs off the, the back of your head. It's really important for, for many things. It's really important for fluent movement, coordinated speech, coordinated thinking. Um, but it does not seem to be necessary to be conscious. People can be born entirely without a cerebellum. And you, know, you, would, you would notice because their, their movements would be not very smooth, but they're clearly conscious. And the cerebellum has about 75% of the brain's total complement of brain cells. This to me is always remarkable. It's not just a matter of the number of neurons. Um, within a human brain, we have, you know, we have this, the folded surface, the neocortex, and then we have lots of structures more deeply buried besides the cerebellum. That these are generally called thalamic or subcortical structures. And it does seem that in humans, we need some sort of intact thalamocortical system. Um, we need signals that flow reciprocally between the thalamus and this folded surface. If you lose that system entirely, then you lose consciousness entirely. But if you lose specific parts of that system, you tend not to lose consciousness entirely, but just to lose specific parts of consciousness. So if I have damage to the visual cortex, I don't become unconscious, I just become visually unconscious. If I have damage to the auditory cortex, the same, same with hearing. The, one of the big unresolved questions in neuroscience, and it's again maybe surprising that it's still unresolved, is what's going on at the front. Yeah. The front of the brain we know is necessary for things like uh, complex thinking, planning, knowing introspection, but whether it's necessary to, for, to be conscious at all is really unclear. And there's a big debate in the field about whether the primary correlates of consciousness are more in the back of the brain or whether they're more in the front. My suspicion is that they're more in the back, but it's still an open question. Um, sort of, again, related, uh, but it's your recent paper uh, in Cell, you talked about islands of awareness and what really oh. caught me what really caught me about this is you were talking, talking about cerebral organoids, which are these little brains that people are now growing in labs to run all kinds of experiments on, and they're not 
like they're not supposed to have consciousness, they're not supposed to be anything. And your argument is pretty coherent that, hey, wait a minute, these things may be alive, they may be sentient, we may not want to do this uh, the way we think we want to do this. And I thought it was, um, I thought it was a, an interesting piece of piece of work. I want to talk to you about it. Yeah, th thanks. For this. Yeah, this was a paper I wrote with a uh, colleagues Tim Bain and Marcello Massimini. It was as in Trends in Neuroscience is a different journal, but um, but yeah, we were picking up on this new technology, and it's a really exciting new technology. It's you know, the ability to grow from human stem cells. They're sometimes called mini brains, but they're not really mini brains. They're 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 brain-like structures. <laughs> Very important distinction. Brain. I mean, they have none of the plumbing, none of the vasculature, none of the many things that distinguish them from real brains. But they are nonetheless 3D brain-like structures that are packed full of neurons um, that have things like EEG signatures. Uh, and so this does lead to this question about: Could something like a, a cortical or cerebral organoid, a brain organoid? Could that be enough for consciousness? Well, yeah, this is on the one hand a really interesting semi-philosophical question because these, these things, these organoids, they don't inhabit bodies. So it's kind of a moot point whether they're alive or not because there's no body that tends to define whether you're alive or not. Um, they, I mean, they certainly sustain, they can be sustained in the lab, uh, but they don't interact with an environment. They don't have a body with which to interact with um, they don't take sensory information. So could something that has never interacted with an environment be conscious? And if so, what would it be conscious of? There's an, you know, there's, that's kind of an odd question that takes, you know, we, we now go from the philosopher's armchair into something that's literally happening in labs around the world. Um, but it's also a, a really significant ethical question because yeah. I think as you alluded, Stephen, this is a scalable technology. These these sorts of things can be farmed. There can be millions of organoids in you know, just generated pretty easily now the technology is established. And so as with all sorts of big scale risks like this, we need to take them seriously, even if it's very unlikely. I think it's really unlikely that the organoids we have now have any consciousness at all. But I would not feel comfortable ruling out that the trajectory of organoid technology will get us to a point where it becomes difficult to tell. And because we can make un, you know, basically endless numbers of these things, even the smallest possibility of introducing you know, conscious experience into the world is something we have to take ethically very seriously because as soon as something is conscious, it becomes uh, a moral subject. It, we're, not just, we're no longer worried about its effect on us. We need to worry about it for its own interest. We don't want to introduce a large amount of suffering inadvertently, and especially if we don't even recognize it as suffering. So this isn't to say this whole thing should be shut down. There's plenty of precedent when people were developing um, genetically modified food, genetic engineering, a lot of proactive ethics go into figuring out, well, what would we do in a situation? You know, what, what kind of signatures or clues would we look for? And so we just wanted to sort of in encourage that conversation to happen. And it is happening. I was involved in a a committee with the National Academies of Science at Engineering and Medicine in the US this year, just trying to establish a regulatory framework for uh, ethics of organoid research. And, and the possibility of consciousness here was, was definitely on the table. I'm, I should say I'm much more concerned about that than I am about another common issue which often comes up, which is like, when is my iPhone? So, so take us into AI, Anil. Go to AI, because you and I also share of the same opinion, which I don't think is very popular at that, um, the fears that an AI is gonna suddenly wake up and become consciousness, but I think both of us feel are massively overgrown and kind of misinterpret what consciousness is. Yeah, well, I'm glad, I, I think we definitely agree on, on this. It's, um, you know, historically people, you know, I think it's because of a historical tendency to put ourselves at the center of the universe. You know, we humans have tend to think we're the smartest creature out there. And therefore, we tend to you know, judge other creatures by how smart they are relative to humans and give them conscious status sort of uh, in proportion to their intelligence. Um, and we've sort of taken that perspective and applied it to machines as well. And I think that drives the, the often unexamined assumption that there'll be some sort of threshold in artificial intelligence that once it's crossed, 
will naturally just lead to the emergence, not just of artificial intelligence, but artificial consciousness. These machines will become self-aware or aware of what's going on. And then, of course, people, for some reason, think that you know some uh, dystopian Terminator scenario will follow and, and we'll all... Uh, we'll all be victims of that. But but I, I think intelligence and consciousness are very, very different things. So for me, in consciousness, and we mentioned this right at the beginning, is much more to do with our nature as living organisms. You know, I like, you know, as I can talk about in the book that's coming next year, I think we are, we're, we're conscious beast machines. We are, you know, Descartes used the term beast machine to argue that dogs, animals, other beasts were not conscious in a sense. They didn't have rational minds. They were just machines made out of flesh and blood. I think exactly the opposite is true, that all our conscious experiences are grounded in the brain regulating, predicting, and regulating the internal state of the body. So for me, consciousness intimately tied to life. And so AI... If it's just sort of unfolding on a silicon chip, that for me is not sufficient for consciousness. At least it's not obviously so. You know, a lot of people assume that consciousness is a matter of information processing of the right sort. I don't see any reason to assume that that's the case. I think it might be intimately tied to something more material, in this case, the materiality of life. Next question right off of this. So, um this is a very, very geeky question. I figure we're getting to the end. I should ask you all a complicated, super geeky question. So one, um, and I'll, I'll sandwich a bunch together, but there's a lot of theories of consciousness around consciousness. It's an emergent property. It's an epiphenomenon of merit. matter. There's global workspace theory, integrated information theory, sensory motor theory. There's nonsensical theories about quantum physics and, and, and consciousness that we talked about earlier. Um, nonsensical is, is the wrong word. Less less than validated. Let's just say less than validated theories about quantum and quantum. Very kind. Yeah. I'm very kind. Um, just in case Stuart Haverhoff is wrong. <laughs> Can you talk uh, a little bit? Um, which theory? Which one gets us closest? Do you have a favorite? Are you betting on one? Well, I'm betting on. Well, I think mine is the yeah. is definitely the most promising candidate. Of, uh, uh, I, well, which of course I, I I actually do, but but I think all these theories have have a lot to offer. And if and I think we're at an interesting point in consciousness science generally. There's now quite a lot of interesting data about the brain basis of consciousness, about its neural footprints in the brain, and we have an emerging landscape of different theories too. But the different theories don't really speak to each other very closely. There's actually some initiatives underway to fund research that is aimed at directly pitting different theories against each other to try and reduce the space of candidate oh, theory great. consciousness. Um, this is an interesting thing funded by the Templeton Foundation, Templeton World Charity Foundation. So I've been involved in a couple of these, these projects. But we come up in, 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 in these projects, we come up against always this problem that these theories are often although they say they're theories of consciousness, they're often actually theories of different things, different assumptions about what consciousness is. And just to, again, get a dive a little bit into the depths of this, people who know about these things. So we have global workspace theory, a very prominent theory due to Bernie Bars and, and Stander Hain. This is the theory that consciousness is involved activation of this global workspace in the brain, a sort of sharing of information between different processes. Um, this is really nice because it's quite easily testable. We can look for signatures of this information sharing and we find them. But it's really a theory of conscious access. It's a theory of what we can say about our conscious experiences rather than the theory of why redness is, is different from pain, let's say, why, why an experience is the way it is or indeed why it exists at all. And then you have other theories like integrated information theory from Giulio Tononi and his group. It's super inspiring. You know, I, I was basically drawn into the field of consciousness science in the early 2000s through reading some of Giulio Tononi's early papers before integrated information theory. But some of the same ideas where contrast to global workspace theory, he's trying to explain the phenomenology of conscious experiences, why they are the way they are in terms of mechanisms. I really love that approach because it puts front and center experience and not functional behavior. Um, but it's a because of its ambition, especially in the way that Giulio Tononi puts it, is very, very difficult to test. 
even impossible in some in some readings. So that's kind of tough. Um, and yeah, my, my take is to be a bit more indirect about it, back to that analogy with life. I think we can have good theories that account for why experiences are the way they are. And if and this is the controlled hallucination view and you know, that the, um, different kinds of prediction give rise to different experiences. But the fundamental kind of prediction on which everything else rests, and this is the sort of center of my own theoretical ideas, are predictions that keep the body alive. And so this is why if I was just going to put a slogan for the theory, it would be that we perceive the world and the self with, through, and because of our living bodies. And that's that's the core of, of this sort of beast machine theory of, of consciousness of self that, that I would argue is going to be the most productive way of explaining uh, consciousness. But again, it's kind of difficult to pit it directly against these other theories because they're all basically framing the question in different ways. And that's in a sense fine, but in a sense problematic. I'm interested. I also think, I think as we go along, we're going to make, you know, maybe we can explain qualia. Why is red red? And why do we, but I, even if we get something like that, which people will point to and say, if we could explain that, we could, I don't, I don't think we're going to get it. I think that's just going to tell us something deeper about perception. Um, I, some of it. So I, we teased everybody. So we were going to have a little discussion on flow at the very end. And so we will, well, it's going to be my last question. You've, um, you've done some really great work. Um, along with Robert Carter Harris's lab at Imperial on uh, what goes on in the brain uh, on psychedelics. Um, and uh, actually found some, you know, really surprised, interesting things that people didn't expect. Um, touch on a little bit about what you discovered, A, and then what do you think that tells us about the neural dynamics of flow? Hmm. I mean, so we, we yeah, given we're, we're coming up on top, so, Psychedelics are superbly interesting, right? Because sorry, is it in five minutes or less? Please answer. <laughs> no, I'm going to be very good. I mean, the psychedelic state is superbly interesting because it's such a dramatic alteration in our experiences of self and world. Um, you know, if there's anything that argues uh, compellingly that the brain is the organ of experience, it's the fact that you can mess around with serotonin receptors and your whole experience of the world and the self changes. Um, and of course, one of the things that, that changes is you know, the sense of yourself as a sort of inner observer. You, you, you might, I mean, I guess there are some similarities to what we think of as flow, though I, I mean, I'm sure, well, you'll know much better than me how best to relate these states, but they certainly are both different from this you know, state that, that uh, you know, I'm in when I'm trying to write a piece of text on the computer where I'm sitting passively reflecting in a very sort of metacognitive way about what I'm doing. What we found when looking at brain dynamics in the psychedelic state is well, reassuringly a massive change. It would be surprising if such a change in experience wasn't reflected in equally dramatic change in the brain. There's, there's big changes in the brain. Many different ways you can summarize them. For us, they appear to be uh, a basically a increase in the unpredictability of the brain dynamics, a, a sort of reduction in the amount by which different brain regions speak to each other and an increase in the diversity of their, of their states over time. It's going to be important to dig down more, more detail here because one of the things that I think might can really connect these two states is, 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 is attention and how attention works in psychedelics and, and in flow. And here, you know, I, I'm just super interested in this, in flow, this, this, this dissolution of self that we get when we're fully immersed and how that relates to the dissolution of self that's reported in psychedelics and whether there's a common cause here and how attentional processing has changed between the two states. So I wonder if you have anything, you know, if, is that, is that aligned with the way you think about these things? I mean, it, yeah, it's very aligned with the, the way I think about it. We are uh, kind of, the kind of undirected connectivity that you guys have observed in the psychedelic states. So the interesting thing about flow is on a certain level, it's almost the exact opposite, right? Cause flow is task specific attention, but mm -hmm. what we think is happening inside the thing you're focusing on, you're enormously creative. So it's a confined space, right? 
So unlike the psychedelic state where the connectivity is all over the place, it's completely undirected, this yeah. seems to be much more kind of directed, but inside that closed search space, it seems like you're going to get all those same kind of wild connections because inflow, anything that can apply to the task at hand and help you do it better seems mm -hmm. accessible. So you get some of the like reaching into the brain for associative connections, but it's much, it seems much more tightly controlled than, mm -hmm. uh, than what shows up in psychedelics. Um, though at, at this point, that is a, is a best guess though. Hope we're getting very close to the point where taking a legit computational modeling approach um, is, is right there. So I think we should have starting to have some realer answers. Yeah. answers that would be brilliant. And of course it'd be brilliant to kind of compare using the same kinds of measures totally. uh, the psychedelic state to the, to the flow state, because I think right. that would, yeah, that would be same. experiments and, ha and how to do this. So we could do that exact same yeah. thing. I have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, super fun. I don't know, Jeff, if you're going to come back on and kick us out, but it has been incredibly fun hanging out with all of you. Anil, it is a joy to talk to you. Um, after an hour, I now have, you know, 16 more hours of questions for you. So if you want to, you know, take a break, go get some coffee. <laughs> we could do this at midnight. Um, I definitely need a beer now. It's, you forget that it's nine o'clock at night here in, in, in Brighton. Um, but Stephen, it was an absolute pleasure, as always, speaking to you. Thank you very much for your generous questions, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this this wonderful event.